Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Food and Beverage Industry Trends 2020, presented by Technomic, Restaurant Business, FSD, and Nestle Professional. I'm Kelsey Nash, Managing Editor at Food Service Director, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Throughout our presentation, we encourage you to interact with our speaker by typing in questions using the Q&A widget on your screen. We will answer questions live at the end of the presentation. You can also customize your window by moving and resizing the panel. If you are experiencing any technical issues, please use the help button at the bottom right of your screen. Please note that you may need to enable flash on your computer in order to optimize the webinar audio as well as the slide deck. We are recording today's session and will email you as soon as the recording is available. We also encourage you to live tweet along with us any interesting facts or learnings you discover during the presentation using the hashtag FoodService2020. Our speakers today are Amy Harvey, Managing Editor at Technomic, George Sedaris, Corporate Executive Chef at Nestle Professional, and Martin Lyons, Vice President of Beverage Marketing at Nestle Professional. I'll now turn it over to Amy, who will be kicking off today's presentation. Take it away, Amy. Thanks, Kelsey. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to what we hope is going to be an engaging, interactive, and informative session on the top food and drink in, uh, trends for 2020. Nestle is partnering with Technomic, we're a Winside company, to research and curate the next forward-looking food and beverage trends for this year and beyond. So today, we're excited to explore what's new, now, and next in the world of food service, and we hope you'll join our discussion by tweeting about our trends using the hashtag Food Service 2020. Um, but first things first, we'll start with a few introductions. My name is Amy Harvey. I'm Senior Managing Editor for Technomic, and I'm heading into my 17th year with the firm. I use our exclusive research tools and our industry and consumer data to report on food and flavor trends and help you understand the implications and opportunities for operators. Joining me today are Chef George Sedaris, Corporate Executive Chef for Nestle Professional, and Martin Lyons. He is Vice President of Beverage Marketing for Nestle Professional. They're here to help all of us gain a deeper level of understanding about what's behind these trends, what we all can anticipate down the road. So we are looking forward to hearing their expert insights throughout our webinar session today. So since 1966, Technomic has produced in-depth research focused on the food service industry, and we are proud to partner with the thought leaders at Nestle Professional today and add the depth of our expertise to their insights. Well, we said at the beginning that this would be an interactive session, so here's where you all come in. What we'd like for you to do is weigh in and offer up your opinion. So here's a poll question for you. What do you think is the most popular food and beverage trend in the food service industry today? Is it flexitarian and plant-based diets? Is it all about nutrition and health? What about global flavors, the different ethnic cuisines from around the world? Food waste? Or is it food that tells a story, sustainability, eco-friendly initiatives? Tell us what you think. Uh, click, vote, submit your vote. Uh, if you're using social media, again, remember that hashtag, Food Service 2020. We're going to give you a minute to get your votes in. Really think about these. Um, what do you see going forward? Is it all about the plants, health, globally inspired flavors, the push to end food waste? Or is it food with a, with a different narrative, food that tells a story, maybe about sustainability or eco-friendliness? We're going to give you just a couple more seconds to get your votes in. So with that, are you ready for the results? Okay, your votes are in, and it looks like it's all about the plant-based world. Uh, just about 45% of you uh, gave the nod toward flexitarian and plant-based diets. So clearly the trends surrounding that are top of mind for our attendees today. But let's hear quickly from our experts, Chef George uh, and Martin. What do you make of our poll results? Any surprises here? Well, I was actually surprised at a low number of the food waste. Uh, I've been to several conferences in the last 18 months, and food waste seems to be a very dominant topic, and we're going to get into that a little bit today. Um, but the flexitarian and plant-based diet certainly is on the top part of everybody's mind. Uh, you can't pick up a newspaper or a magazine without someone uh, 
launching a new product or having some new revelations on it. So I'm very excited about these topics. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. Thank you, Paul, Taylor and Amy. Thank you. Well, as you said, we are going to, to get more in depth with each one of these different topics. Um, but no real surprise that everyone is talking about plants. But we're, with that, we're going to begin with our first major trend. And it's fitting that we explore a new direction for health and well-being uh, at the start of every year. It seems that consumers are redefining health for themselves. And so they're continuing on this path. Uh, of uh, defining it for themselves, and we're predicting the emergence of food and beverage with function. How can food and drink enhance youth, beauty, and brain function? So this is all about how ingredients can increase energy, lighten your mood, improve concentration, beautify the skin, just a whole range of healthful results. So this is, this is a new approach to health that we're going to be exploring this year. And according to technomic data, 40% of consumers say that their definition of healthy eating has changed over the last two years to cover more attributes. So we wonder about the change, um, whether it's from surfing the internet, following Instagram influencers, or actually learning about the science. Consumers are becoming more educated about nutrition and health. About one-third strongly agree that they're seeking specific nutritional benefits when they make food choices. Um, they indicate that they're eating more food because of specific nutritional benefits than they did just two years ago. So they're reading food labels. They're looking for menu transparency around specific ingredients, um, whether that's uh, protein or whether it's antioxidants. Those are really resonating right now. But they don't want a menu to call an item out as healthy or nutritious. They'd rather see these nutritional benefits tie into lifestyles and beauty enhancements or brain function. So in fact, we know that a significant proportion of consumers would purchase functional food and drink even at an increased cost. So according to Technomics most recent Healthy Eating Consumer Trend Report, which is an in-depth study where we examine the purchase drivers and behaviors and preferences for 1,000 U.S. consumers, 67% of consumers would be more likely to buy food and drink with functional benefits, and 32% would pay more for food and drink that was rich in uh, anti-inflammatory ingredients or ingredients that relieve stress or contain probiotics aid digestion, and other functions. So not only is this uh, a strong purchase driver, it also uh, has the ability to drive higher spend. So the way that this sort of functional approach to health is taking shape is through physical, mental, and emotional health. And we asked about some of these new functional ingredients that consumers may have heard of, but haven't fully grasped what the benefits are. But it's clear that they're willing to learn about all of the functional benefits and that even if they haven't tried them yet, they're interested and want to give these trendy ingredients a try. So this can be a way for operators to really set themselves apart in terms of differentiation for food and beverages. So let's take a look at what the data is saying. Now, some of the most trendy functional ingredients, such as activated charcoal, which is said to be a detoxifying agent, collagen proteins that are said to enhance beauty, spirulina, which is said to give the metabolism a boost, lotus root, uh, relieve stress, um, and turmeric. You know, there's lots of information out there about the anti-inflammatory properties of turmeric. Um, what we find is that when we ask them to select the option that best describes their familiarity with these ingredients, we found that the highest proportion of respondents indicated that they may not have tried these particular ingredients yet, but they would if they were given the chance. And that may be the most important takeaway for many operators who are trying to gauge first steps in introducing innovative, healthful products. Oftentimes, what we're hearing from consumers is that availability and visibility of new ingredients, even for a limited time, can spark their purchases. So here's where the consumer needs to, to perhaps be a little bit more educated and informed, but they, the interest is definitely there in giving these functional ingredients a try. 
So on the previous slide, we saw that these beauty and brains ingredients are being presented in three major ways, physical, mental, and emotional benefits. So here are a few examples of how these functions are being applied to the menu. Protein Bar has a bikini smoothie with collagen, and collagen is said to reduce wrinkles, keeps your joints strong and flexible, supports strong bones, and increases skin hydration. Uh, Honey High in Los Angeles has a dandelion herbal coffee with chaga mushroom, ghee, and MCT oil. MCT is said to provide better brain and memory function, uh, gives you an energy boost and increased endurance, aids in weight loss and improved weight management. And the Surf and Turf with CBD-infused Bernays from Adrienne Black in Astoria, New York, CBD oils are said to reduce anxiety and decrease inflammation. So you have the physical, mental, and emotional side of how ingredients can provide function in a healthful way. So what do our experts at Nestle make of all this? Let's hear from them now. Martin, let's start with you. How are manufacturers delivering against this need for healthy uh, beverages? Yeah, Amy, so I, I think certainly from a, from a beverage perspective, many of these you know, added benefits work extremely well in, in, the beverage, in the beverage sector. You know, the addition of turmeric or spirulina or charcoal, you know, the, the, these are products that are already, you know, they're out in the marketplace already very much in a ready to drink format, perhaps less so in a mainstream restaurant uh, environment, but although the menu incidences are quite low, uh, these are trends that we're seeing not just emerging in the States, but also in many other markets across Asia and Europe. So the, the, the less about fat, these are very much um, added benefits, um, health from within, which we see from our global insights is, is happening across the world, not just in this marketplace. But at the end mm -hmm. of the day, whatever these benefits are, they need to add some value. It can't just be about the perceived benefit. There has to be some real benefit because often there is a considerable premium for these products um, amongst our operator customers. Mm -hmm. Good point. And Chef George, what about you? What are you seeing in terms of health, especially as it relates to functional foods? Uh, you, do, do you see it as a trend that's here to stay? Well, food has always been functional. Food as is a medicine. Um, it's problematic for a couple of reasons in that making these claims, um, a lot of times these claims are based upon uh, inaccurate science or sometimes they are just uh, the fad of the month. So from our point of view, it becomes really problematic as a regulatory thing. Um, and, but the health claims are, uh, are here to stay, as Martin said. So. Uh, it's easy enough for us to provide a pathway to allow those consumers that personalized nutrition, um, providing them a pathway to make those choices. Uh, Turmeric's been mentioned for an example. Turmeric is a, a great anti-inflammatory. However, a lot of people don't realize that if it's not mixed with black pepper, you don't get the full, full effect. So mm -hmm. as, as Nestle, the manufacturer, we can start adding those things and making it a fully functional food. Uh, certainly, the inclusion of probiotics in food um, is, uh, is a great pathway to that. Um, one of the things I've become recently interested in is uh, uh, the medium chain triglycerides. It improves that memory uh, and uh, emotional stability, but it also helps with the keto diet and uh, helps with ketosis and burning fat. So, that can become a great addition in the morning to coffee to people. So, um, I think they're here to stay. I think we. Uh, uh, and let consumers make that choice, provide them opportunity. All right. Good stuff. Now on to our next trend. Plant-based foods, they're advancing rapidly on the menu in terms of the sheer uh, number of items that we're seeing. And we're talking about true creativity in the preparation and presentation of veggie-forward offerings, meat analogs, Plant-based is moving beyond uh, being something regarded as healthy towards something that's just tasty, an everyday normal offering and a sustainable ingredient. So this new plant-based world is very much guided by consumer preferences. More than ever, consumers are connecting the simple description of plant-based as a signifier of health. Technomic research shows that 67% of consumers believe that simply calling a food or drink plant-based 
means that it's inherently healthier. More than half of consumers, 58 percent, say that they're more willing to buy items that are plant-based. And again, this doesn't just drive purchases. It drives higher spend. 26 percent of consumers agree that they would pay more for plant-based offerings. And that's the true power of this trend. Uh, it's the strong health halo. It's the willingness not only to buy, but the willingness to pay a higher price. So here's a few examples of how plant-based alternatives are playing out on the menu, some things that we've noticed that are interesting. It reflects some of the very innovative uses of fruits and vegetables uh, and meat analogs, but the focus is definitely on meat-free yet high-protein components. So at Sunrise Memphis in Tennessee, they've created a King's Oatmeal dish with what they're calling coconut bacon, so coconut uh, flavor to mimic uh, the texture and taste of bacon. Awesome Burger, and also Awesome uh, Crumbles um, from Sweet Earth, a plant-based alternative similar to the Impossible and Beyond, Beyond Meat Burgers. Um, and then Jack Wings. So this is jackfruit, cheesy vegan jackfruit nuggets uh, topped with a gluten-free crumb. This is out of, out of Leon in the United Kingdom. So we're seeing uh, several different ingredients being made to either mimic meat um, you know, or to just to provide some interest on the plate in the form of plant-based protein. Um, and the sheer number of menu items just continues to grow. Over the last five years, Technomic has noted, and this comes from our uh, Ignite menu data, a 371 percent jump over the last five years of plant-based proteins on menus. And so when we think about what's next, um, we've really seen trends pointing to plant-based seafood, plant-based eggs, sauces, and other ingredients. So what is plant-based seafood? Um, we see it being made with soy proteins, a mix of things like tapioca starch, potato starch, and different seasonings, everything from crablets, crab cakes, to vegan fish, shrimp, lobster, and scallops, um, and vegan eggs made from various protein isolates, um, colored with different carrot extracts. Um, so there's some interesting things happening in terms of innovation for plant-based proteins. Now, on the beverage side of things, of course, beverages are always going to be plant-based. There's not, I, I can't think of any beverages that have meat in them. Um, but let's talk a bit about the trendiest interpretations for new drinks like milk. Um, this is an example of a trend that continues to progress in new directions all the time, and it's all about going dairy-free. So this is definitely a drink that is really going to appeal to the vegan consumer or the flexitarian consumer who wants to go vegan sometimes. Now, we've all been familiar um, with the first interpretation of this trend, um, which is nut and seed milks. Um, such as almond, cashew, coconut milks, but now it seems that just about any ingredient can be milked. So look at all of the new fruits and vegetables and even grains that can be processed as milk. So at certain Starbucks reserve locations, they have vegan oat milk, and this is, this is oat, uh, milk that is processed from oats. Um, at the Swill Inn in Chicago, they have a really interesting cold brew. It's called the Banana Cold Brew, a uh, mix of co cold brew coffee made with sweet banana milk. So just a couple of really unique and kind of fun um, different types of alternative milks. So now let's turn to the experts once again and ask about the influence of plant-based fare this time. We'll start with Chef George. Um, why don't you weigh in? How are operators serving the needs of patrons who are looking for more plant-based foods today? So I think the savvy operator has got to look at what the driver behind this trend is. Um, is it a sustainability issue or is it a, is it a medical or a moral or an ethical issue? Or is it just, you know, uh, something that revolves around experiential uh, uh, ex uh, Instagrammable moments for customers? Um, I think we all acknowledge that a plant-based uh, diet can be certainly healthier and certainly it's, it's very sustainable, uh, that uh, many experts maintain that the meat model is not, uh, not, going to be, not going to be around for a very long time. Uh, as an operator, I always thought that plant-based foods, and I always had plant-based foods on my menus, is that those people that are making those dining out decisions for groups are typically, if they're a plant-based eater, typically have that veto power about where they're going to eat. 
So we allow them to have something at that, at that dinner table when they come to our restaurants. Uh, more importantly, it allows them to participate if you have a plant-based burger um, in the same dining experience everybody at the table has. The only thing that changes is they swap out uh, the patty that they're eating. So there's this level playing field with dining out. Uh, there's that communion you get to share with, uh, with your fellow diners. Um, and there's a, there's a certain dining with dignity. You're not over in the corner chewing on some, uh, some dry chips or some pasta salad that you didn't really want to order. So I think from an operator, it's, 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 a, it's a sustainable op uh, opportunity, uh, certainly an ethical and moral opportunity, and it's certainly a profitable opportunity. And um, so I think, I think they're around, going to be around for quite a while, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think that we've made great strides in that arena. Great. And Martin, we, we tapped into the latest trends for alternative milks, for example. Uh, anything else to add there about beverages? We touched on it briefly, but what else are you seeing out there in the marketplace? Yeah, I, I think certainly in the beverage arena, the, the addition of vegetables and combining vegetable and fruit juice fusion. So, the increasing use of, of beetroots or celery or, or kale, um, all of the uh, sort of a mashup between you know the core citrus product, but then also bringing in some of the, the spinach and the, the celery and the kale to give to give not just added fiber but also different um, different proteins, different ingredient benefits. So I think, as Chef said, people are talking about plant-based primarily from a non-meat perspective. Uh, and as you mm -hmm. rightly said, most beverages are plant-based, uh, but increasingly it's a, a different way of how we drink our traditional orange juice for breakfast. We're now looking at people drinking, you know, carrot and orange juice or celery and apple juice um, to give them not just variety, but also um, less sugar, um, less calories in, the, in those drinks um, for, for those day parts. All right. Great, thank you both. So we hope that you are tweeting about our trends, and if you are, remember to use hashtag FoodService2020. Uh, and if you're not tweeting yet, this trend is a pretty great place for you to start since it's all about the year of the fad. We believe that in 2020, our industry won't wait long to see if a hot trend has long-term traction. Instead, they'll take the risk and jump ahead of the trend while it's still in the fad stage. So everyone's looking to stay one step ahead of what's hot, and we think 2020 will be the year that many operators won't necessarily worry about trends with staying power. Instead, they'll look for fads that are hot for the moment. And that's because today's consumer audience has a shrinking attention span. Just as expected, the information age has changed general attention spans. According to a recently published study, from researchers at the Technical University of Denmark, due to the sheer amount of information presented to the public, our attention spans are narrowing. So how is this affecting the food service industry? In 2020, we think it will mean restaurants will either start to menu more of these wow factor, uber limited time offers to cause media frenzy, with food and drink that's either expensive or kind of hard to acquire from suppliers or so off the wall that they know enthusiasm won't last. They'll be hot for the moment. And what this means is that we will progressively see operators, even those large chains, jumping out on these fads instead of waiting for the trends to take shape as they have in the past. So the first thing that kind of springs to mind when we're talking about fads on the menu are fad diets. And we are actually seeing an uptick in specific diet plans that are hot right now um, being called out, for example, as keto-friendly or paleo-friendly offerings on the menu themselves. And what's interesting is that these fad diet offerings, which tend to be higher in protein, lower in carbs, are being positioned on the menu as lifestyle items. So again, that whole idea of personalizing health making the definition of health your own, not calling out nutrition as much as calling about lifestyle. So fitting that healthy item as part of your own lifestyle. And when we look at the saturation 
of these particular fad diets, we can see that a solid proportion of consumers indicated that while they haven't jumped on the bandwagon, yet they'd consider doing it in the future. So whether this particular fad continues on the menu remains to be seen, like all popular diets or fad diets, so-called they tend to fade away in some form or fashion over time. But for now, there are operators capitalizing in consumer interest in these diet plans. But what makes a fad? What actions drive a fad forward, especially for our industry? Well, in this day and age, it's about the customer's willingness to use their own social media platforms to boast about the food or drink and make it instantly visible. So it's no surprise that younger adult generations are the influencers here, particularly uh, millennials, who even as they age up, they're the group most likely to be engaged with social media during dining occasions. So we ask them, what, uh, when you visit restaurants, do you often take pictures of your food and post it to social media? 31% of millennials said that yes, they do do this quite frequently, uh, and 23% of Gen Z, who are the youngest adult consumers, they agreed with that as well. So look for the younger adult uh, consumers to continue to drive this kind of trend, but they are the ones who generally create the fads. And it all boils down to what is most visually appealing. What's going to add color or some sort of artistic angle to my Instagram page? What cool image of a color-changing cocktail, as we see right here from Yard House? Um, what, you know, which, what would be great to have a snap uh, for my Snapchat? So these operators had the right idea in 2019, and this is the kind of activity that's going to continue. Um, if we, we looked at France, at Speed Burger, they had pink burgers. We saw something similar uh, a little over a year ago with black burgers in Japan. So a different colored bun uh, takes a great picture. The tie-dye frappuccino at Starbucks last year, um, following on the heels of their colorful unicorn frappuccino the year before. So again, continuing with this super colorful, highly visual beverages. And then as we said at Yard House, the magic margarita made with butterfly pea flour. So it changes right there in the glass um, when it's mixed with the other um, spirits and ingredients in the glass. So something really eye-catching, great to catch on video. Um, this is what a lot of younger consumers really, really want to be engaged with. And here are some ingredients, too, that we're calling head scratcher fare because they may leave some people scratching their heads wondering, can I really eat that? But that's what a fad is all about, jumping in on something fun and being a bit adventurous. And so here are some examples that we're seeing more and more of out there on the menu, things like cheese tea. So at Ross Sushi Bar and Restaurant, they have a rockin' iced cheese tea. And what does that taste like? Well, this was a, a choice of... Um, the customer has a choice of either iced matcha or black tea, and it's topped with a layer of coconut and cream cheese. Um, they can also get it spiked with rum, but what this really leaves uh, the taste of is kind of like cheesecake almost um, in your mouth. Um, wheat lacoche, which is a corn fungus, um, at Acorn in Pittsburgh, it's paired with escargot and mole. And edible insects. Um, at Evil Pie in Las Vegas, they have a canyon hopper pizza, and it's topped with grasshoppers. So a little bit out there, uh, definitely a fad and definitely something that is Instagram worthy. And so the last part uh, of the year of the fad trend has to do with what we're calling mouse magic ingredients. So again, these point to the wow factor. Um, these really solicit some prize some surprising sensory reactions, such as sweet limes. Looks like a lime, but it's sweet and mild, not sour or bitter at all. Habanada peppers, they look like habanero, but they don't have the heat of a habanero. And Sichuan bud, so this is a mouth tingling. Uh, it looks like a simple flower, but it actually makes your mouth go numb. So just as this past year was all about the surprising visuals that we just talked about um, with the different cocktails and beverages, this coming year will be all about drawing consumers in the door with these sensory responses that are surprising uh, in the mouth with food and flavor. So we are going to go back to our experts now, and this time we'll start with Martin, and we'd love to hear more about 
some wow factor beverages, some surprising things that maybe you've been seeing across various industries. What are some unique drinks um, that you've seen that could be the next beverage fad? I think it's interesting, you know, the use of the head scratch affair when, you know, maybe for us here in America, um, huitlacoche is, is head scratching. But, you know, if you're Mexican, we've been eating huitlacoche for, you know, 20, 30 years. And, you know, if you're living in Singapore or Thailand, then, you know, insects are, are part of, you know, part of the, the food culture. So I think it's right. just that for us um, in the USA and certainly also in West, Western Europe, these are these mm-hmm. new, they are different, and, and therefore they are quite challenging. Um, you talk about sweet limes. Uh, there's a, a, a lime called a calamansi that comes from the uh, Philippines. Um, really, really popular uh, calamansi-flavored iced tea that, that we see coming in from Asia. I, I guess this is, the, this is the part that's so exciting about the, the food service industry. We, we, we get to try things early, we get to try them soon. Um, yeah. There's a lot of fast pace of change, but ultimately, I guess for every operator, it's, you know, we could all jump on fads. Uh, the challenge for the operator is, you know, how do I make money out of this, and, and how do I keep keep it operationally simple? Um, the, the challenge is, you know, how much effort do I have to put into building a business on fads that may only last three months, six months? Um, mm-hmm. So picking the right horses and then ensuring that the, the investment goes into creating the awareness at the point of consumption, but also making it meaningful for the operator and both the consumer. Right. And Chef George, I'll pose the same question to you. What are some wow factor foods, some really interesting things that you've been seeing in restaurants, maybe colleges and universities or hotels, for example? Well, certainly I've seen the insect-based uh, based model that uh, everybody's doing. A lot of seen that in a lot of colleges and universities. Um, and once again, that just, be, I think, um, actually, I don't like calling it insect based. I like calling it micro livestock. I think that's a much more, <laughs> uh, much more easier term. Uh, and because I think it's Spanish, uh, as Mark pointed out, insects are consumed worldwide. Um, I think the fear factor that goes with eating them goes a long way in, in driving that. Um, personally, we've got uh, here in our R&D facility, we've got some different insect powders and uh, I can't get past the smell. They're okay. Uh, I don't think it's. I don't think it's going to be a sustainable thing for myself. But certainly, when I'm eating these uh, things, I'm, I'm Instagramming them to my friends and family. Um, I do want to talk about an experience I had uh, a couple of years ago when the Szechuan bud became extremely popular. Um, I was at an American Culinary Federation conference, and they were they were showing them, and my immediate reaction was uh, similar to. Uh, I don't know if you all remember the movie. Uh, big with Tom Hanks when I mean, he was at that party eating caviar, and they told him what it was, and he's got his tongue out and he's wiping it with his with a napkin and just gagging. Um, this second one, but if you've never had them, they're completely explosive in the mouth and have that Szechuan numbing pepper flavor to them, um, and it lasted for hours. I couldn't I couldn't taste anything but that bud for an hour. Um, wow. A totally negative experience for me, but however, the upside was is I got a, a major story to tell to all my chef colleagues and my customers <laughs> for weeks and weeks to go. And here I get to tell it again. So um, uh, that's certainly a trend that uh, that's a one-off. And like Martin said, where's where's the profitability? And if you're looking for buzz, there we go. Um, certainly <laughs> we can, and certainly we can talk about the diet trends as well. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you, too. So we are going to get into our, our final trend bucket today, and it's one we're calling Eco Everything. We believe that 2020 is truly going to usher in a more well-rounded approach to sustainability. It's not just about the environment anymore. We're talking about a whole new economy around sustainability. And sustainability as we see it now happening, it's much more than just a menu initiative. It's emerging as part of the food service industry's new circular economy. So what we are seeing is that we are evolving from a linear approach of create, use, and recycle to create, use, find ways to reuse products, new ways to recycle, 
and then new ways to sustain and keep this whole cycle going. So we expect that the industry is going to incorpor incorporate a much wider range of resource efficient circular practices in the name of sustainability. And it is clear to us that sustainability matters more to food service operators than it ever had before. And all signs point to its importance increasing year after year after year. So Technomic recently asked restaurant operators to tell us, how important is sustainability to your operation today? And as you can see, only 7% said that it's somewhat unimportant. Uh, 4% four said, 4 said that it's not important. But overall, 73% of operators said that they expect sustainability and or social responsibility, which is really the next wave of sustainability today, that that's going to take on a greater role within the next two years. 45% of them said it is very important to their operation. So we are seeing this become even more important than ever to operators. Operationally, they have to figure it out how to do good and do well at the same time. And the way we see this is that it's all about being efficient with resources. So here are some trends that we are seeing uh, cycle forward right now, starting with su sustainable cut programs. So we've seen here in the U.S. and overseas um, that Starbucks is um, tasking different locations with a reusable cup program. So again, that's adding that reuse sort of um, initiative to the cycle. Um, so at London's Gatwick Airport locations. Customers have the option of paying a surcharge for a regular disposable cup or to opt for a free reusable cup. So this was a trial that was in partnership with Hubbub and they offered 2,000 reusable cups. So they continued to monitor the number of returned cups and then they tested uh, different collection points to maximize the number of returns. Um, but even if only 200 and 50 customers opted for that reusable cup, it could save more than 7,000 disposable cups during the trial that it had that month, according to Starbucks. So it's something that um, is, is really impactful. Um, we're also seeing Duncan. They, um, they began um, eliminating foam cups worldwide in February 2018. Um, they are choosing to completely eliminate foam material from their worldwide chain supply by this year in 2020. We're seeing lots of other independent restaurants too start mug share programs. Uh, so these are independent coffee houses. Um, different cafes, for example, out of Boulder, Colorado, have started a mug share program that allows customers to exchange stainless steel mugs uh, at other participating cafes or at drop-off kiosks. So there's so much happening. We could go on and on about the number of chains and independent restaurants that are offering either sustainable or reusable cup programs today. Traceable sourcing of paper products. Today, restaurants are considering products derived from renewable sources, whether that's uh, recycled or plantation-grown fiber from quick-growing trees, um, packaging made from waste wheat chaff and other materials, um, paper and board packaging made from virgin fiber that is sustainably sourced from renewable plantations. So a lot of things also happening uh, for traceable sourcing. And then finally, leftovers, um, new ways to process and distribute food leftovers. So we, there are different apps available here in the U.S. and it's something that is really cycling forward fast in Europe and the U.K. Um, where users can log into these apps, see which participating restaurants in their area have surplus food available, order the leftovers, usually at the end of the night, and pay through the app so they can go pick up their food at a time designated by the restaurant. So this is all about even, uh, in some cases, um, eliminating food waste at the end of the day for a restaurant. So some really interesting things happening. We're even seeing uh, restaurants um, connecting with businesses that have extra food and then connecting those businesses with organizations that serve people in need. So again, as we were saying, you know, operators want to do good. They also want to do well. Um, these are new business initiatives that support a sustainable economy. 
So here's how this is playing out on the menu, this whole idea of waste not. Um, the chefs of Chicago's dynamic group, which includes Sienna Tavern, Prime and Provisions, and Barrio, each created a no-waste dish to showcase throughout the month of April last year. So at Prime and Provisions, for example, the kitchen repurposed any remaining steak from the men's porterhouse for two, three, or four um, into the no-waste steak sandwich. This is created by Chef Joseph Rizzo. So the sandwich was wrapped to go for a day after meal. So um, whatever was not eaten um, can be prepared as a gourmet sandwich and wrapped to go. And so they did this in connection with Earth Day. Um, there's edible coffee cups at Air New Zealand, um, a delicious way to kind of, um, uh, you know, turn that cup into something um, that can be eaten. So no waste there either. And the peas and thank you cocktail, and this is made with um, pea tendril scraps that are made into an oil. This is at Providence in Los Angeles. So let's gather some insights for our experts now, and this is a pretty weighty topic, food waste. Chef George, we're starting with you. How are you seeing food service operators address food waste today? So I, um, I, was, I have a classical background and classically trained in French uh, cooking, and they were the ultimate recyclers of food. Um, if you look at a classical kitchen, Nothing went to waste. Bones went into the stockpot. Vegetable scraps went into the stockpot. You were making soup stocks. You were making your foundations. Everything got consumed. Uh, what went in the trash can was a total was totally a waste. So a lot of operators, I think, have moved past that, moving into a lot of pre-portioned and value-added foods. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing in, in that is operators are shrinking their menus and they're using those items on their menus uh, in a multiple way. So you have multiple functionality of that ingredient. So you get that velocity, you're getting more use out of that ingredient, and it's shrinking that waste. It's making that waste opportunity less and less. And portion sizing, I think uh, there's no one on this call that wouldn't say they've been out to a restaurant and uh, the portions are way too much. I was at a place just the other day and uh, the entree came with two 10-ounce pork chops. I mean, that's, that's a meal for three or four days for me. Um, so I think operators are starting to look at controlling portion costs, going to smaller plates. Smaller products typically have a, a, uh, a perceived value. They have a better food cost, um, and they provide variety. Um, we're seeing uh, pop-up kitchens where uh, they're centered on waste and that they're they're collecting waste, they're gleaning foods that are uh, ugly foods that would not make it into the supermarket and repurposing those into something. Uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, there's a great little organization there called La Soup. Um, it's a group of chefs, they uh, get together, they have, they have uh, recovered over a million pounds of food in the last five years and turn it into soups and uh, distribute those soups throughout the uh, uh, homeless shelters, congregate feeding shelters around the city. So it's it's an act, it's, a, it's a small group activity at points too. Uh, all eating, all food is political. Uh, your own personal food waste is uh, is a great place to start uh, choosing and buying wisely. Uh, buying that ugly piece of fruit um, and doing something with it immediately. So there's a lot of things on this horizon, and it's a very exciting time uh, to be. Uh, thinking about this uh, problem. Great. And Martin, uh, we want to touch on the manufacturer perspective. What are some things that are being done to create food and drink um, that tells a compelling story? I think certainly from a manufacturing perspective, you know, we, we have two responsibilities. You know, obviously, there's the operational side providing the, the products we provide to our customers in, in formats that allow them to <clears throat> reduce their own waste and be operationally more efficient. But a lot of the focus that Nestle specifically is addressing is around you know, the complementary food waste is the, the packaging waste and packaging reduction. <clears throat> so you know, Nestle globally has made a commitment that we will have 100% of our packaging to be either recyclable or reusable by 2025. Um, that, that takes a major global commitment, and there are many organizations like Nestle who are, who are, who are making those steps. I think when you look at it operationally, um, I think the U.S. market has to look to other marketplaces who are so much more advanced in the whole area of 
packaging and, and product waste. You know, markets like Switzerland, the Nordics, Germany, who have got very, very um, uh, large infrastructures in place uh, to manage and, and better control packaging waste. So I think that the, it, it's out there, and I think it's the responsibility of both the manufacturers and operators to look to those countries that are already way ahead of this market in, in how they're addressing these issues. Um, it isn't going to happen overnight, um, but it, it, it's about taking that first step and making those commitments um, because it, it is going to become an increasingly bigger issue, um, and we're already seeing that. Mm -hmm. I'd have to agree. Um, in our research um, for this particular topic, so much of what was innovative and guiding this trend was coming out of a uh, European market. So an interesting take there. Thank you. Well, now that we have uncovered our 2020 trends, we want to leave you um, with the key takeaways of our research. And we hope that the Five key findings that, that we're about to present will provide some actionable insights for your business this year and beyond. Uh, first things first, understand that macro trends, we've talked about some very broad topics, health, sustainability. Um, they have very broad implications for the whole industry, and those trends themselves change gradually over time. But it's the micro trends within these major trend buckets that are cycling forward much faster. The economy is influencing it, consumer behavior is influencing it, technology is influencing it. And so operators and consumers are responding quickly to the trends within the trend much faster than ever before. So it really is going to require um, our whole industry to be more nimble and creative in how we address these trends to meet the needs that are changing so quickly. Um, just consider, for example, how much differently health continues to be defined year after year after year. It seems like every year health is a major theme, but it's the new definitions and the new approaches that require renewed attention. And this year it's all about personalization, uh, individualized health with a focus on function, natural enhancement. Our third takeaway is about social responsibility. It's a solid expectation. It is central to the way food service brands should be positioning themselves in the marketplace. It's central to the way operators should be telling their larger food story. Talk about the good that you're doing for workers, for animals, for the planet, and for the local community. It's not even a differentiator anymore. It's important to understand that this is what's expected now, and social responsibility can be communicated in plenty of newly emerging ways. Fourth, uniqueness is crucial. We are operating in a world of hyper choice. That means that food service is being offered everywhere we go. So in order to keep capturing that guest attention, visitation, increased spend, operators must make the investment into some of these outside the box flavors and ingredients and experiences. So take a risk, a calculated risk though, whether that means investing in limited time or seasonal offerings to build buzz, creating colorful Instagrammable drinks that are here today and gone tomorrow, um, or offerings and deals and promotions, even themed events that can enhance, enhance the in-restaurant experience. Focusing on uniqueness can go a long way in 2020. And finally, Meet your customers where they're at. I mean, clearly every trend won't apply to everyone's customer base. If you think your customer's ready for new functional foods, start with one ingredient that may be most familiar to a mainstream audience. Are you catering largely to a younger customer base? Just remember the importance, again, of social responsibility in the form of sustainability. What does your brand stand for? Communicate that. Remember the need for food uniqueness bigger, bolder flavor profiles, but every customer won't be ready for every trend. So get to know your customer base, be ready to respond fast to meet their specific needs. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention today, everyone. It looks like we do have about 10 minutes for questions. So Kelsey, I'll kick it off to you. Sure, and for everyone on the line, as a reminder, you can ask Amy, Chef, George, or Martin a question for the next 10 minutes using the Q&A widget on your screen. So we had a couple questions come in about menu transparency, and Amy, I will throw this to you. Uh, this person asks, 
is the, the trend to have nutrition information and ingredients available on menus in order to avoid the veto vote of maybe someone who's vegan or has specific allergies? Uh, yeah, I mean, that that's one way to help ab avoid the veto vote. Just make make the, the information clear up front um, so that everyone in the party has a chance to prove what, you know, best fits into their lifestyle and their specific diet. I know that there are some markets where, um, you know, calorie counts and things like that are, you know, mandatory and, and part of the, the local regulation. So um, it goes without saying that some will have um, – you know, that classic nutritional information like calorie counts or um, different nutritional content. But I think that providing some sort of, um, you know, nutritional information um, is, a good, is a good way to eliminate the, the veto vote and even, you know, just to keep the customer um, better informed. Very good. Um, another question here, someone asked, uh, whether plant-based foods have as much unhealthy processing as some meat-based foods. Um, Chef George, any insights you could share there? Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, that's, that's a common question asked a lot, and I think uh, what it goes back to is I think we're looking at menu transparency. It's about reading labels and it's about making those decisions. Um, every manufacturer, every uh, everybody producing plant-based foods has a different manufacturing process and ethos. and. Um, I would encourage people to read labels and be informed. I think it's your best uh, your best strategy in that field. Sounds good. Um, Martin, do you see the trend continuing where food producers will name dishes and products in terms of what they resemble, such as, you know, watermelon being labeled as vegan tuna or perhaps some uh, alternative beverages being named as milk? Um, is this something that you think will continue or will uh, producers – kind of create new unique names to really differentiate themselves? I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a challenge here from a, from a marketing perspective but then also from a legal perspective um, as to, you know, as, as to what those definitions are. I think the consumer is increasingly savvy and increasingly looking for transparency rather than uh, a, a smoke and mirror trying to define some things that it is that it actually isn't. So uh, from, certainly from a manufacturer perspective, I think the responsibility is to be transparent um, within the guidelines of the, the legal legislation legislation that, that states what, what and how we should be defining the, our products and the ingredients in our products. Absolutely. Um, a beverage-specific question here, so I'll toss this one to you as well, Martin. Um, someone asks what they should know about coffee trends for the upcoming year. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, I think co coffee continues to grow at, at a fast pace, um, especially the specialty coffees, you know, espresso-based, cappuccinos, lattes, uh, mochas. Uh, there is, you know, the, the USA is, is the biggest coffee market in the world, um, and, you know, the, the, the trends that we have seen for the last five years continue. I think you're seeing a lot more personalization um, I think you're seeing a lot more focus around provenance, uh, uh, sourcing of ingredients, uh, where those beans are coming from, uh, from around the world, different flavors, different profiles. Um, I think the, the advent of the Starbucks reserve locations brings a whole new dimension to coffee that the consumer hasn't seen before, so they can really experience what is a, a great cup of coffee, um, and, and that we're seeing not just in the USA, but all markets around the world. Sure. Um, Amy, you mentioned a few times the rise of functional um, ingredients and maybe the health halos that we're seeing on menus. In that vein, are non-alcoholic drinks something that's on trend for this year? Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we've done several um, beverage studies where um, uh, so-called mocktails or um, uh, non-alcohol beverages kind of meant to mimic that behind the bar are really emerging fast. Um, it's not just about, um, you know, soft drinks and, and juices, although those, of course, continue to, um, you know, trend forward and, and track forward in different ways. Um, but also just these um, spirit-free um, is 
as a non-alcohol drink, the spirit-free side of the menu is one that we is really going to take off. Um, that's that's the new trend for you know if you're dining out and and everyone else is ordering cocktails and you don't imbibe, you don't drink alcohol, you can still um, really have something really interesting and it's it's much more um, much more fun and much more engaging than maybe simply just ordering uh, a simple soft drink or a lemonade or an iced tea. So when we, uh, what the biggest trend, uh, you know, that we're seeing um, for non-alcohol beverages is really going to be spirit-free. I think everyone should keep an eye on that one. Sure, absolutely. Um, Martin, another coffee question here. Someone asked whether fair trade coffee will be more prevalent in the coming year, and whether uh, customers might be more willing to pay for pay more for that. I think there's a, I think the understanding, the consumer understanding of what is fair trade, what is Rainforest Alliance, what is UTS, um, all of those different certifications is is, um, is is quite low. I think there's a lot of confusion about what certification means. Um, fair trade is very different to Rainforest certification. It's a certification, but it focuses on different things. Um, I think the the importance is that we are focusing on sustainable coffee whether that is Fair Trade certified, UP certified, or um, Rainforest Alliance certified. Different organizations require for their own customers and their own consumers different um, certifications. So I think the responsibility is to provide the choice that allows the customer to decide what certification they want. So Fair Trade is available, Rainforest is available, UP certified is available. They all do different things. Uh, I think the challenge is communicating to the consumer what they stand for. Great. Uh, lots of questions on beverages today, Martin. Another one for you. Any trends on teas that you all are seeing? I'm sorry, would you say that again? I, I've missed it. I apologize. Oh, no problem. Any big tea trends for the coming year? Uh, I think in the report that was, was mentioned there of a dandelion based tea, I, I think we're seeing lots of the use of different botanicals. Um, in China and Asia, they use a lot of chrysanthemum-based petals. I think you're also seeing increasingly uh, the growth of uh, green teas and matchas. Um, I, I would suggest, you know, given the time, that those, those members of the audience who are interested in this definitely go to our website, um, nestedprofessional.com, and, and get the report where we've got a lot more information on what those, not just tea trends, but the, the beverage and food trends that we've tried to have a quick insight into today. Okay. Um, Chef George, any big trends in frozen desserts that you predict for the next year? Um, well, we're seeing a trend uh, spike in plant-based uh, plant-based uh, uh, plant ice creams, uh, tofus, uh, soy, uh, lots of startups, a lot of fruit-based ice creams. Um, we're, uh, you know, the fad last year was aquafala, where they were using uh, water from uh, uh, garbanzo beans and whipping that into meringues and making desserts out of that. Um, we're certainly seeing that, uh, that trending. Um, we're also seeing a spike in, uh, in uh, you know, chilled beverage or uh, chilled desserts that uh, are uh, vegetable-based. I've seen some broccoli and some beef uh, ice creams out there that uh, are okay. I had one uh, in a gelato in uh, Rome recently that was a, uh, uh, a pesto base. It was uh, basil and uh, walnut. That was excellent. Oh, very cool. All right, well, we are running up to the end of our time today, so that will conclude our webinar for this afternoon. As a reminder, you'll receive an email when the on-demand recording of today's event is available. And on behalf of our sponsor, Nestle Professional, we thank you all so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you again.